rising to the setting sun. His love endures forever, and by the grace of God we will carry on. His love Heavenly Father, we rejoice today that indeed your love is forever and that forever you are with those who trust in Christ. Thank you for your presence with us each day, each moment. Thank you for your presence here in this house of worship. May our praise be acceptable to you and may we be encouraged through the preaching of your word, the reading of scripture, the prayers and song today. Father, draw us closer to yourself in this hour and send us from here better equipped to speak a good word for our Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, amen. Please be seated. Welcome to chapel on this Tuesday morning. It's already been a great chapel in song. Thank you, Dr. Mark Taylor, for leading us. Dr. Taylor will be back in just a little bit to continue to lead us in song. Uh, Logan Reynolds is going to help us out this morning with the reading of Scripture. And then uh, just before our speaker, a message in music from Dr. Jill Springer and Dr. Kurt Springer. And you're going to enjoy that. I'm excited about our speaker this morning. He is well known to the seminary community. Dr. Craig Blazing is our provost. But in uh, accepting the responsibility of introducing him to you today, I began to think that some of you are in your first semester here. Some of you are new to Southwestern and you, you might not even know what a provost is and what a provost does. So I thought I would help us out a little bit. And being a teacher of, of rhetoric and good English usage, uh, if you want to know what something is, you go to the dictionary. And so I have. Uh, here's the American Heritage Dictionary definition of provost. There are four senses of the word, and I began looking at the bottom. A provost could be the chief magistrate of certain Scottish cities. And uh, Dr. Blazing has his Ph.D. from the... University of Aberdeen, and so he studied in Scotland, but I, I rather suspect he's not the chief magistrate of a Scottish city. Uh, since number three is the keeper of a prison, a provost can be. And about this time in the semester, some of you may feel like you're serving a prison term, but I, no, I, I don't know that. I, but meaning number two, the highest official in certain cathedrals or collegiate churches. Well, he is a uh, ordained Baptist preacher. He's a Baptist pastor, but we're low church people and we don't have cathedrals. So uh, number one, there it is, a university administrator of high rank. Uh, Southwestern Seminary is organized on the basic university model with several schools, and so our provost is the administrator of the highest rank next to the president. Well, 
that tells us what a provost is, but doesn't quite help us uh, with what a provost does. I noticed that in the etymology of the word, though, it comes from the Indo-European root apo. So I consulted some of the words that also come from this Indo-European root. One of them is apposition. When you know when you study language that a, an appositive is a noun or a noun phrase that's placed alongside another one that helps uh, explain it. And in his relationship with our president, our provost often has to come alongside our president and explain him to various <laughs> publics. And so that, that seems uh, an appropriately related word. Well, also in his relationship with the president, there, there's also this term. Here's another uh, root, uh, interpose. Uh, and this means to come between uh, a couple of people. And uh, having been a seminary president myself, I know that the line of people who would like to strangle you has no end. And so sometimes the provost has to interpose himself between the president and others. And then believe it or not, that same root, uh, it, there's also this related word, compost is related. <laughs> to provost. Now, you may wonder, what does dealing with dead organic matter and manure have to do with the provost? Well, presidents are like circus elephants. They need people to come along behind them and clean up. And whatever comes out of the president's office, our provost is there to take it and work it and spread it around and make it useful, no matter what it is. The provost. This is a valuable position. Well, the provost also does things for the faculty, and uh, the word propose is related to provost. And uh, when you join the faculty here, the provost proposes you to the president. It's also related to the word dispose. And, uh, you know, he puts us in the proper order. And if we get out of order, you may be disposed of by the provost. Uh, but then there's, there's this one. I, I like this word. Another related word is deposit. And uh, he makes sure that there's enough money in the budget to see to it that all the faculty get paid. So, Dr. Blazing, thank you so much for being a good provost and making sure the deposits are made and that the faculty gets paid. But this morning, finally, there is another word, and this is indeed related to provost, and that is the word exponent. And uh, our speaker comes today as a professor of theology and a preacher of the gospel as well as our provost, and he is one who is equipped to ably expound the Word of God. And so, Dr. Blazing, we appreciate you for all you do for us and for Southwestern, but most of all in this hour, we appreciate you as a faithful exponent of the Word of God. And so, uh, following the scripture reading and song, and our special, would you be in prayer for Dr. Blazing as he comes to bring us God's word? Would you please stand in honor of the public reading of God's word? This morning we are reading from 1 Samuel chapter 9, verses 15 through 27. It says, Now a day before Samuel's coming, the Lord had revealed this to Samuel, saying, about this time tomorrow I will send you a man from the land of Benjamin, and you shall anoint him to be prince over my people Israel, and he will deliver my people from the hand of the Philistines. For I have regarded my people, because their cry has come to me. When Samuel saw, when Samuel saw Saul, the Lord said to him, Behold, the man of whom I spoke to you, this one shall rule over my people. And then Saul approached Samuel in the gate and said, Please tell me where the seer's house is. And Samuel answered Saul and said, I am the seer. Go up before me to the, to the high place, for you shall eat with me today. And in the morning I will let you go and will tell you all that is on your mind. And as for your donkeys, which you, were lost, which you lost three days ago, do not set your mind on them, for they have been found. And for whom, and for whom is all that is desirable in Israel? Is it not for you and for your father's household? And Saul replied, Am I not a Benjaminite of the smallest of the tribes of Israel, and my family the least of all the families in the tribe of Benjamin? And so why then do you speak to me in this way? 
And then Samuel took Saul and his servant and brought them into the hall and gave them a place at the head of those who were invited, who were about 30 men. And Samuel, said, and Samuel said to the cook, bring the portion that I gave you concerning which I said to you, set it aside. And then the cook, the cook took up the leg with, with what was on it and set it before Saul. And Samuel said, here's what has been reserved Set it before you and eat, because it has been kept for you and, and until the appointed time since I said that I have invited the people. So Saul ate with Samuel that day. And when they came down from the high place into the city, Samuel spoke, to, spoke with Saul on the roof. And, and they arose early, and at daybreak Samuel called to Saul on the roof, saying, Get up, that I may send you away. And so Saul arose, and both he and Samuel went into the street. And as they were going down to the edge of the city, Samuel said to Saul, Say to the servant that he might go ahead of us and pass on, and you remain standing now that I may proclaim the word of God to you. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Thank you for that reading. Let's continue in a worshipful attitude as we sing. Please be seated.
I hope that at least once in your life you'll have the opportunity to go to Israel. You've got to do it. You've got to go and see what is there. I love to ask people who have gone to Israel, what was the thing that you most enjoy seeing? And uh, they were Happy will... birthday to you! Happy birthday! Am I going to preach this sermon? Yeah. <laughs> this is a sign that we love you. Okay. Now, we also know we should show up today and um, let you know that your birthday is tomorrow. Because we know that the first thing to leave as we get a little bit more wiser in life is that thing called memory. So <laughs> you may be challenged today. So we're here to remind you today that your birthday is really tomorrow. So don't go to the restaurant today and ask for discounts and everything because it's tomorrow officially. Thank you so much. Yes, sir. <laughs> and I know my job is done after this moment. <laughs> so we, as the, uh, some of the music faculty, we want to just come and say how much we love you. And we also want to pray a prayer over you. Is that okay? Thank you. That's great. I think we need to pray. Yeah, we need to pray. <laughs> so, hey guys, okay. let's pray for the provost. Okay. But please, do not close your eyes. This is not a holy prayer. Okay? <laughs> so, here's the prayer. <laughs> oh, God. Grant Dr. Blazing the senility to forget the people he never liked. <laughs> The good fortune to bump into the ones he does like. And the eyesight to tell the difference. <laughs> and Lord, please let him remember what he is preaching about today. Thank you. Really Amen. Really Thank you so much. We love you, sir. Happy birthday. Thank you so much. Thank They never taught me in preaching class what to do after something like that. <laughs> On my own, okay. Well, thank you, Dr. Day and music faculty, I think, uh, for <laughs> remembering my birthday tomorrow. After tomorrow, I will remember it, and I will certainly not forget you. <laughs> so we, we appreciate that. <clears throat> well, um, Let's do pray, and let's, let's go on with God's word. Father, we do thank you. Thank you for the goodness of the Lord. Thank you for joy that we can have in the Lord. And thank you, Lord, for your kindness and goodness to us that allows us to come and to hear your word. And so, Lord, now as we come to your word, we pray for your blessing upon it, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you go to Israel and you see what is there, there are many things to see, and when you do, the Bible comes alive. That's the reason to go. There's uh, one thing, you know, to read about the events in the Scripture, but it's another thing to see where it happened. It's, you can read about going down to Jericho, but when you actually go down past the sea level, down to Jericho, you have a sense of what that means. There's one thing to hear about the, the, the Sea of Galilee and Jesus preaching on the shore. It's another thing to visit it and see it and to take that in because what you see impacts what you read and what you see in the Scripture. For some people, it's the, the things around the Sea of Galilee. I'd love to go to Capernaum. 
And go to Capernaum and you can see the ruins of the synagogue there, the excavation of the, the houses around the synagogue. And then you think back to, to the opening um, of Mark's gospel where Jesus was preaching in the synagogue and then went to Peter's house, which you can see, walked down the street, think of the people coming out of the houses to see him, bringing the sick to, for him to heal. And it's something to actually go and to see it and then see the text of Scripture. And, of course, love to go to Jerusalem and to walk down the streets in the old city to go to the garden tomb, to see the, the place where possibly Jesus was buried. There's two sites there, and you can visit both of them. But to go to the place where these things took place, just fill your mind with a, a context and understanding of God's Word. The thing is that when you're there and when you're seeing these things, you kind of have to focus. <clears throat> you have to get your mind on, on that uh, because there's a whole lot of other things that are happening around you, and you've got to sort of factor them out of your mind. I mean, there's cars and buses. There's taxis. There's people. There's um, houses and buildings of all sorts. They're not from ancient times. They're really from modern times. And if you take a moment and think, you know, there is actually something else to see here in this land because it's not just ancient times, but there's something happening today that you need to take in. And that's the presence of Israel in the land today. Now, when you move from the old city and you go west to the western side of Jerusalem, then you're really in a, a situation where you're in the modern. In fact, when you move to the west side, you come to an area of government buildings. There's the Knesset there. There is the Supreme Court. There's the Bank of Israel. There's various government buildings and houses. There's museums and things to see. And you really know that you're in present day in Israel when you are there. Love to visit that area because there's a wonderful museum there. It's the Israel Museum. Lots of things to see. It's a modern uh, museum, but lots of antiquities and things. When you're there... If you go to one end of the Israel Museum, there's something really interesting to see, and I'd like to show you a couple of slides uh, on that. Uh, there, is, uh, there is this. Actually, if you approach it from the exterior, this is all you would see because that part of the museum is underground. If you look at it, that, that little structure looks like the the top or lid of a jar. In fact, it's made to look like the lid of a Qumran jar because this is the museum of the shrine of the book. And it houses Israel's collection of Dead Sea Scrolls. If you go down and inside the shrine of the book, you would see this. There is an exhibit that looks like the top, looks like the handle of a Torah scroll. And then as you come down, there is the cylinder of the scroll. And if you, if you were to look on the sides, this looks like the inside of a jar, like a Qumran jar. And along the sides are exhibits of various Dead Sea Scroll fragments, and they are at different levels. You can go down those levels. But in the middle, you, you don't even notice those exhibits around the side when you walk in because that thing that's in the center is what captures your attention. And as you walk up to it, the walkway around it, you will see that what's on there is the Isaiah scroll that was discovered at Qumran, the complete text of Isaiah. Now, when you're looking at it, you're not actually looking at the actual Isaiah scroll. That's a facsimile. The real one is in a vault underneath this structure, and only special people get to see that. 
But the facsimile that's there, you can see it's a very good facsimile, and there's just a few in existence, a few facsimiles in existence, one of which we have here at Southwestern Seminary. And we occasionally put that on display in the Phillips Library here in this building. The interesting thing is that this text was buried for a long time. The entire time that Israel was out of the land. But now that there has been this return, this text has been recovered and it stands there as an exhibit on display to anyone and everyone to see. It's in that scroll in that text, which is the same text that we have in our Bibles, that we find our text for this morning. And if you would turn in your Bibles to Isaiah 43, verse 8, this is where we are. Isaiah 43, verse 8, bring out the people who are blind and yet have eyes, who are deaf and yet have ears. All the nations gather together and the peoples assemble. Who among them can declare this and show us the former things? Let them bring their witnesses to prove them right and let them hear and say, it is true. You are my witnesses declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me no God was formed, nor shall there be any after me. I, I am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. I declared and saved and proclaimed when there was no strange God among you, and you are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and I am God. And also, henceforth, I am he, and there is none who can deliver from my hand. I work, and who can turn it back? This text <clears throat> has to do with a situation that is projected into the future from the time Isaiah is writing. Isaiah is writing around 700 BC, and uh, this part of Isaiah uh, is, a, is a portion of the book in which he positions himself and the reader forward in time to something that God is gonna do in the life of the people. All up to Isaiah 39, there have been warnings of a judgment that's coming, and this judgment is anticipated at the end of Isaiah 39 with Chaldeans who come and survey the situation in Jerusalem. Because in fact, the great tragedy for Jerusalem is that there will be a destruction that comes from Babylonian invaders, and there will be an exile from the land. But in this part of Isaiah, he projects forward into the future, looking past that destruction at the time of a return. And when that return happens, that it's going to be a, an international incident. In fact, it's going to happen through an international convulsion. And so what he envisions in this text here in verse 9 is an assembly of the nations. They're all gathered around trying to figure out what has happened, what is going on. Might even call it like a United Nations assembly. There they are, depicted as if they were in a council trying to figure out what has happened. And what has happened specifically in this text is that the people have come back people of Israel. This is what he says in 43 verse 5. I will bring your offspring from the east 
And from the west I will gather you. I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the end of the earth. Here they come. They're all coming back. And the question in verse 9 is, who knew this was going to happen? Who knew that this was going to happen? Who predicted this? Who, who can explain why it is happening? Now, this is actually part of an event complex. Going back to chapter 41, all the nations are gathered. In chapter 41, verse 1, the Lord calls them all together and says, all right, everybody assemble. All of y'all, come around, come around. Here we are. And the question in 41, verse 3 is, who stirred up this one from the east? Now, he's referring to Cyrus the Persian. Nobody saw this happening. The world order, the international order, consists of Babylon, defeated Assyria, and Egypt. These are the great powers. There are other powers around, but these are the great powers, and Babylon is the main power. But somebody comes out of the east, this Persian. Nobody saw this coming. And the question is, who did this? Isaiah 41, verse 2. Who stirred up this one from the east whom victory meets at every step? He gives up nations before him so that he tramples kings underfoot. He makes them like dust with his sword, like driven stubble from his bow. Who did this kind of thing? Verse 4, who performed and, and, and has done this, calling the generations from the beginning? He says in chapter 26, or verse 26 of this chapter, who declared it from the beginning that we might know and beforehand that we might say he is right? You see, you're, when you're trying to figure the cause of an event, one of the questions is, did anybody, did anybody threaten that this was going to happen? <laughs> you see, was there a note ahead of time? Hey, in such a time, such is going to happen. Okay. And now we have to find who gave that threat <laughs> because that's the person who did it. And so this is the question that's being asked here. Now, the Lord answers the question. Verse, chapter 41, verse 4, I, I the Lord, the first, and with the last, I am he. Verse 25 of chapter 41, I stirred up the one from the north, and he has come from the rising of the sun, and he shall call upon my name, and he will trample down all these kings. I did it. The question among the nations is, did any of you see it? No, they didn't see it. In chapter 41, when they all come into this assembly, they're all coming bringing their gods with them because this is how they try to figure out what's happening. And it's a really uh, a very subtle humor that's in this passage because as they're gathering, the, the idols tend to fall over. So they're coming in to this council, imagine like a UN council, and they're going to discuss this question of how this happened, and they're setting up their idols. But wait a minute, we got to bring in the, the handyman here because he's got to nail this thing onto its seat. Uh, so just hold on a moment. And so we nail this thing down, and now, okay, we try to answer. But in, as he says in chapter 41, you don't get any answer out of them because they are nothing. There's nothing there. And not only is there nothing there, but he says, you are nothing. <laughs> he says, uh, verse 24, chapter 41, behold, you are nothing, and your work is less than nothing, and an abomination is he who chooses you. Verse 27, I was the first to say to Zion, behold, here they are. I give to Jerusalem a herald of good news, but when I look among you, the nations, I don't see anything. There is nothing out there. Nobody has a clue. So here we are in this international incident. In actual fact, God has declared everything that's going to happen from the beginning to the end of this. He was the one who declared the whole event complex. Isaiah chapter 1, he said that there is coming a fire upon Jerusalem. He said that there would be invaders that would come. He said in chapter 3, several times that Jerusalem would fall. He said that nations would come and seize the people. Very interesting language and prophecy in Isaiah chapter 5, verse 26. He says, he will raise a signal. He, the Lord, will raise a signal for nations far off and whistle for them. 
And they will come from the ends of the earth, and behold, quickly and speedily they come. Oh, none is weary, none stumbles, none slumbers or sleep, not a waistband is loose, not a sandal strap is broken. I love the poetry of this passage. The language, their arrows are sharp, their bows are bent, the horses' hooves seem like flint, the wheels are like whirlwind, the roaring is like a lion, like young lions they roar, they growl and seize their prey and carry it off, and none can rescue. They growl over it, like the growling of the sea, the metaphor for the nations. And if one looks to the land, Behold, darkness and distress, the light is darkened by the clouds. See, this is not a migration of people. We talk today about migrations. We have an issue in Europe of a great mass of migration of people. This is not a migration. What this is, is that a people have been captured. They have been kidnapped. They have been taken away by a captor, by a predator. Uh, They've been seized, and they have been removed from their place and scattered, and there is no expectation of of them coming back. But here in chapter 43, they come back, and there's been no revolt. See? There was no revolt in Babylon. The Jews revolted. There was a rebellion. They seized arms. See, they stormed the, the citadel, and, and they, they, they broke out, and they got back. There's none of that. That's not what happened. What indeed happened? Chapter 42, verse 14, the Lord says, For a long time I have held my peace. I kept still and restrained myself, but now. Now what does he do? Well... 42, 16, I will lead them out. I will guide them. He leads them out. He brings them back. 43, 5, fear not, for I'm with you. I'll bring your offspring from the east, from the west. I will gather you. It is the Lord who gathers them back. And then I like this in chapter 49, verse 24, when he asks this question, can the prey be taken from the predator? See, chapter 5, there's that lion growling over the prey. You can't get that thing away from that lion. Can that happen? Can the prey be taken? Can the captives of a tyrant be rescued? For thus says the Lord, even the captives of the mighty shall be taken, the prey of the tyrant be rescued, for I will contend with those who contend with you, and I will save your children. This is God. The only thing that can be said is it's God who did this. And so he brought a destruction on Babylon. He raised up Cyrus the Persian, and he, he smote the captor. He killed the predator, and he released his people and brings them back. Isaiah has several chapters prophesying the destruction of Babylon and even prophesies Cyrus by name in chapters 44 to 45. He names him. That's because the Lord knows what he's going to do, and he does it. So God has done this. All the nations are gathered in this court scene in chapter 43, asking who, has proclaimed, who predicted this and who has done this. <clears throat> and so they need witnesses. And if anybody says, hey, I knew that was going to happen... Well, that's easy to say, but the question is, did anybody hear you say that? <laughs> Do you have a witness to the fact that you said that? See, that's what brings us to verse 10. And in verse 10, this is where you could imagine in this court scene, here we have, you know, the judge, and here we have in front of the judge are the attorneys. And here on the one side is the defense Attorney, and you can imagine here that the Lord is here and Israel is a witness. And this is the point where the Lord turns to Israel and says, you're it, you're the witness. So go up. Okay, so they do. 
He says, verse 10, you are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I've chosen. So they go up and they sit in the dock. Now the attorney comes to, to question them. You know, this is a typical questioning. Okay, can you explain to the judge and to the jury what it is that you saw and that you heard? And the witness just sits there. And he said, would you please explain to the judge and the jury what it is that you saw and that you heard? And the witness just sits there. And so finally the frustrated attorney says, are, are you deaf? And somebody speaks up, actually he's deaf. He's deaf? Yeah, he's deaf. Okay, can somebody communicate to him <clears throat> by sign language or whatever that we want to know what it is that he saw? Well, we can't do that because he's blind also. You have a witness who's blind and who's deaf? <laughs> what kind of a witness is that who's blind and deaf? You know, and then you look back at the defense bench. Here's the attorney and, you know, the, the attorney's counsel, and they're all like this, you know, they're shaking their heads, you know, what if, you know, we've got a witness who's blind and deaf. This is not particularly helpful. You see, he said here, verse 8, bring out the people who are blind. Their, blindless, their blindness is an issue here in 42, 19, where he says, who is blind but my servant, or deaf as my messenger whom I send? Who is blind as my dedicated one, or blind as the servant of the Lord? So the Lord has a blind and deaf servant. The question I ask you, does it make any sense to have a blind and deaf servant? You imagine yourself, you know, at a restaurant, for example, and, uh, you know, you look up from the table after reading the menu, and there is the waiter, and so you try to give your order, and he just stands there. He doesn't take it in down, and you just tell him again, and you ask, you know, are you deaf? You know? Uh, I mean, this is not helpful. Imagine him coming and bringing your food out, and he passes your table by, and he just keeps on going. You say, wait, you know, we're over here, you know? But he's blind. I mean, who would hire a servant, a waiter, who's deaf and who's blind? That's the problem in this text. The blindness is a condition of Israel. In Isaiah chapter 6, you know, where Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up. Do you notice that it's only Isaiah who sees the Lord in the temple? And when he is sent, when Isaiah is sent and to, to talk and to preach to the people, the Lord tells him, tells him, they will not hear you. Because he's closed their ears and their hearts are hard and they become blind. And how long is this going to last? It's going to last all the way until the destruction. When the cities are destroyed, and the land is a waste. What's the situation? Eyes have got to be opened. They've got to be able to see. Now, isn't it interesting, though, in this passage about the nations and Israel as a witness, that the nations need a witness? Do you notice that? The nations actually need a witness somebody who has seen, somebody who, in verse 10, who knows the Lord, somebody, in verse 10, who believes the Lord, somebody who understands who the Lord is needs to give a witness to the nations. Because without that witness, the nations will not see. They will not understand. And so when we read this verse, you are my witnesses, we, of course, think to Acts chapter 1 where Jesus said, you are my witnesses. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. You are to go and disciple the nations because the nations need a witness. And that's where you and I come in. Those who have had our eyes opened, who have had our hearts opened, have got to be this witness to the nations. 
Well, some repented. They came back. The interesting thing is they come back, they come back blind. There were some who repented. We read that in Ezra and Nehemiah. There were some who repented. Zechariah talks about it. But Zechariah and Malachi also talk about a problem that persists and continues. And by the time you get to Malachi and the end of Malachi, it's getting worse. And then we come right on down to the first century. Daniel saw it. Daniel predicted that, yes, Jerusalem would be rebuilt. The people will come back. The city will be rebuilt. The temple will be rebuilt in Daniel 9. But, Daniel, there is a period of time opening up, and there is a future destruction of a temple and a city because the time of wrath is not ended yet. We come to Luke chapter 19, and Jesus laments over Jerusalem because he says, you didn't know the day of your visitation. You didn't see it at the end of John's gospel. Right before John chapter 12, the upper room discourse, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. But see, they did not see because their eyes were closed. And so, again, off into a destruction and off into a dispersion. But then we come to today. Remember, we had that text that's up there that's witnessing to Israel and to all the nations that come and see. What are we seeing today? After a long period of absence from the land, there is this return. Let me just show you some slides on this. Starting in 1882, what's called the first Aliyah, which is a return to the land, 35,000 came out of Eastern Europe into the land of Israel, 35,000 Jews. The land was under sovereignty of the Ottoman Turks at that time. We see then in 1904 to 1929, second, third, and fourth aliyahs, as it's referred to, a total of 162,000 returning out of Eastern Europe to the land of Israel. The sovereignty of the land passes from the Ottoman Turks to the League of Nations, World War I, and then to the British Mandate. 1929 to 1939, the fifth Aliyah, 250,000 come out of Germany. This is the time of fascism in Europe, and the Jews are coming out of Europe to the land, many of them. But during the Second World War, 39 to 45, and then, of course, to 48, the founding of Israel, Aliyah Bet, 138,000 come out. You say, well, why didn't more come? Because they were restricted. They were prevented. They were not allowed to move. Even the British, after the end of the war, prohibited them coming, except in small numbers. They had to sneak in in order to get in there. But then, after Israel becomes a state, look at this, 48 to 71, over 600,000 coming out of Europe. 331,000 coming out of Asia, 400,000 coming out of Africa. Here are the major countries from which they're coming. And if you see out of Europe, they're coming out of Eastern Europe, primarily Romania and Poland. They're coming uh, out of the Muslim countries, out of Iraq, Iran, Turkey, Yemen, Pakistan, coming uh, 254,000 out of Morocco, Tunisia, Egypt, Libya, Algeria, these Muslim countries. And as they left those countries, they left behind everything. 72 to 89, it continues. The migration out of Asia has decreased and Africa has having decreased because they've all left out of the Muslim countries. And by the way, those Muslim countries of Iraq and so on, there were Jews living there from the time of the Babylonian dispersion. Because, see, they didn't all come back. 
in Isaiah 43, the, the time context of that. They didn't all come back from Babylon, even though he said later in Isaiah, depart, go out from Babylon, but they didn't. Many of them stayed there and stayed in those dispersed countries. 50,000 came back with Ezra. But look at the numbers that are coming out now and the fact that they've depopulated these areas. Many coming out of the USSR. We move forward 90 to 99. We have 800,000 coming out of Europe and they're coming primarily from the former Soviet Union. Look at these numbers, the Russian Jews, and notice the number coming out of Ethiopia, 2000 to 215. Here are the numbers. They're continuing. They're coming out of the USSR and now particularly out of France, the former USSR. Here's where we are today in Jewish population. The largest concentration of Jews are now in Israel. It used to be said they're in the United States. It's not true. It's in Israel. The U.S. has 5.43 million, Israel 6.38 million, the non-American Anglosphere 850,000. France, Russia, and the Ukraine, those three countries, about 730,000 Jews living there, are the major source of immigration into Israel today. That's why the heavy line the dotted lines show that they are still coming from the other countries, but they're primarily coming out of those countries. Now, he said in Isaiah 43, I will bring your offspring from the east, and from the west I will gather you, and from the north give up, I'll say, and to the south do not withhold, bring my sons from afar. What do you see when you look at this and when you look at the land of Israel? The nations around ask this question, what is going on here? And they have their explanations. The explanations are sociological political explanations. Well, we'll use a Marxist uh, political or economic theory. You know, that's the reason why this movement is taking place. There's various secular theories of, of you know, of what is happening here. They're political. Well, these people are trying to take land from those people and all this kind of stuff. But they don't see what the Lord is doing. Well, what if we ask the witness? He says here to Israel, you're my witness. So you, you get up in the box and give a witness. What does Israel say? You know that Israel is primarily a secular nation? You know, there's a portion that are religious Jews, but these are Orthodox Jews who continued the traditions of the Talmud, which developed out of Pharisaic Judaism of the first century. So we have that and we have the secularism that's there. Does anybody see? There is a, yes, there is a group. There is a group who know the Lord, who turn to Yeshua to find salvation in him. But they're a small group. So <clears throat> where are we then in Isaiah 43? We, we need to have witnesses here to what's happening. Now, at this point, you ask the question, why am I talking about this? Well, there's two reasons. Number one, there is a blindness that exists about what God is doing with nations in the world. And you need to have in your theology a place and categories of what God is doing with this nation and with nations in the world. God has a plan for nations and is at work with respect to those nations. You need to open the theological eyes of your mind to understand this because it's part and purpose of the plan of God. And the other thing is that we've got to reset what's called Christian Zionism. I have um, recently contributed to a, a book that you'll see um, out. If it's not out already, it will be out soon on a new Christian Zionism. 
And why is this necessary? Because we have a problem with what's called Christian Zionism. One, there is a Christian Zionism that's associated with false prophecy teachers. There are people who go to these prophecies in Scripture and trying to predict dates and all kinds of things like that. That is inconsistent with Scripture. There are people who go to the Scripture and go to prophetic texts in order to to stimulate the curiosities of people talking about blood moons and things like that, but they don't look at what the text is actually saying. And the text actually is speaking about what God is doing with this people in the world. We also have to reset it away from those who reject the gospel. There is a Christian Zionism that rejects the idea of giving the gospel to Jews. Did you know that? International Christian Embassy in Jerusalem, uh, one of the long Christian Zionist organizations, uh, rejects evangelism. You should not give the gospel to Jews. Well, why not? They are under the opinion that if you do that and if a Jew accepts the gospel, he ceases to be a Jew. And they say, well, didn't you read in Ephesians 2 that there's no longer Jew and Gentile? And you see, God has a place for this people, and he's working with his people, and he can't do that. If they become Christians, they got to remain Jews. This is misguided. Paul also said in Ephesians 2 that, uh, that uh, and in Galatians 3, there's no distinction between Jew and Greek, but also between male and female. Does that mean that men and women who accept Christ become androgynous? No, and neither do Jews or Gentiles who accept Christ lose their ethnic identity. A Nigerian Christian is a Nigerian. A Korean Christian is a Korean. A, a South African Christian is a South African. A Mexican Christian is a Mexican and a Christian. And God has a plan for people. The point about the unity in Ephesians 2 is what Christ does is he takes away the hostility. And if there's any place where hostility needs to be taken away, it would be in Israel and in the Middle East, would it not? You see, eyes have to be opened. And the point to be made is there only, there's only one who gives light and sight to the blind. Isaiah prophesied about him in four prophecies of a coming servant of the Lord. And he said he'll be a light to the nations. He'll bring the prisoners out of darkness. He will open the eyes of the blind. But he also said that he would be despised by the nation. And he would be rejected. Isaiah 50, he would be spat upon. He would be struck. Isaiah 53, he would be crushed. But he would bear our iniquities. Upon him is the chastisement that makes us whole, and he will make the many to be righteous. Because Isaiah prophesied of an everlasting salvation that is to be set up and that would become for this people Israel and for all whose eyes are opened. There is coming a great revival. The scripture predicts that this people will have their eyes opened. Paul in Romans 11 says, you know, this is the mystery. He couldn't figure it out. See, among the court of the nations that some eyes of Gentiles start to be opened before the eyes of the actual chosen witnesses would be opened. But see, that's what began to happen in the preaching of the gospel back in the first century is that Gentile eyes began to open. And the interesting thing is that for the past 400 years, Gentile eyes that have been opened have been rereading the scripture and seeing that, hey, you know, God actually has a plan for this people and have been at work in the history of the nations over the past 400 years to call the nations to account. You've got to make it possible for this people to come back. But the strange thing was that 
they didn't understand how they would come back because many of the texts and the scriptures keep speak of them coming back in blessing and knowing the Lord, but not our text. Our text says that they once came back blind. And the possibility of that pattern not only exists, but it's being played out before our very eyes. What's needed? What's needed is that the light needs to be taken to the people because there's going to come a time when all Israel will be saved. That doesn't mean every last one necessarily, but there we are a people who believe in a revival. And there's going to be a revival. And so let me ask this question to you as we close. What does it mean to you to be a witness in advance of an expected revival? If you know that one's coming, what does it mean to you to be a witness in advance of that revival? What a great time to be that witness. And maybe God's calling some of you to go to Israel and be that witness as he sends you to various nations around the earth because the light has to come. The question is, what do you see? Do you see that salvation that's coming? Do you see what God is doing in the world? Let's pray. Lord, we do thank you for the wonderful word of God. We thank you, Lord, for the the plans and the promises of God that you bring to pass. You are the only God, and we acknowledge you and give praise to you for a great salvation. And Lord, today we pray for Israel, a people in whom you delighted and you chose long ago. And Lord, we pray that you would open their hearts and that you would open their eyes and you'd open their ears to hear the word of the Lord. And the Lord, that you would turn hearts and that you would bring your people to know the wonderful grace, the mercy of forgiveness. In your son, Yeshua, Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. One of the reasons I never miss chapel, if I possibly can, is it always enlivens my faith and it enlightens my mind. Thank you so much, Dr. Blazing, for doing both of those today in a wonderful, wonderful message. A few announcements before we go today. Uh, Mission trip opportunities for 2017. You can learn about those in a meeting in the chapel lobby today uh, with the World Mission Center. Uh, Their upcoming trips to uh, the Republic of Georgia and Chiang Mai, and you can learn about those in the lobby right after chapel. And then the Libinars, and I'm thankful that the Oats Department has finally instructed me that it is Libinars, not Libinars, Libinars. And so I come as Pheidippides from Marathon to instruct you with the news. It is Libinars. And so go forth. And uh, the Libinars come uh, October the 11th at 11 a.m. and October 12th at 7 p.m. in the Roberts Library Computer Lab. So these folks have a lot of uh, useful things for you, and you need to go. Early voting begins in the Student Center October 25th, 26th, and 27th from 8 to 5. And then upcoming chapel speakers uh, on Thursday of this coming week, Dr. Evan Leno, uh, professor of ethics, will be preaching. And tomorrow, who's preaching tomorrow? Oh, I am. Uh, okay, tomorrow, uh, Dr. Blazing is uh, presiding tomorrow, and, uh, and I am preaching. I hope you'll pray for me. It's in your best interest to always pray for the chapel speakers. Because you don't want us to flub up. You want us to do a good job because you want to be blessed. So keep me in your prayers and Dr. Lino as uh, we prepare to preach the rest of this week. Uh, Brother Taylor, come and lead us and let's stand as uh, we go out with song. Join us as we sing.
forever.